This is Christians Wake Up, and today I'm going to be talking about Christmas and the truth about Santa. So this is Yaban from Christians Wake Up, and uh, that's the subject we're talking about today because we're entering into the Christmas season, and during this time, everybody's... Um, it, it's called the most wonderful time of the year. Everybody's going out getting gifts and putting up their decorations and uh, decorating their Christmas tree, decorating uh, their house with ornaments and uh, different things of that sort. So I want to show you from the word of the most high what this holiday really is and expose what the heathens won't tell you about this holiday its origins and how the most high absolutely hates when i say hate i mean hate this particular day now i know a lot of christians will say no 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 we, we celebrate christ on this day well once i get done you'll understand the deception that was done to add his name to this holiday and you'll also see how this holiday is pagan from its very root. And not only is it pagan, it's how uh, people say it's the most wonderful time of the year. In the eyes of the Most High, it's the most horrible time of the year. So I want to lay out this. Uh, this I'm going to do it slowly because there's a lot of uh, things that. I have to connect for you. Um, there's a lot of videos out there on this subject, but all the videos from the ones that, that I've seen so far, most of the videos don't make this one connection. So I'm going to go about it a little bit different. So there are, like I said, other videos out there, great videos by other uh, brothers and sisters who are beginning to understand exactly what Christmas is. And there's a lot of in-between things um, throughout history that they've done. But the the where I'm going to go is I'm going to show you how this is connected in a different way. So what I want to do is first, I just want to lay down the foundation scripture. It's going to be found in Ezekiel uh, chapter 20, verse 39. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 39. Let's go there now. All right, Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 39. Let's read. It says, as for you, O house of Israel. So we see he's talking to Israel. So as for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, go ye, serve ye everyone, your, everyone his idols. And hereafter also, if ye will not hearken unto me. Now here, listen to this. But pollute, and let's look up that word pollute. Uh, let's see here if it'll come up. There we go. Profane. So the word pollute is the word profane. It says, but profane ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. So right here we see God has a problem with a couple of things. What he said was there was profanity with his holy name, with gift giving, and with idolatry. So three things, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. Profane ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. This is for the house of Israel. So now we also we know that everybody's not the house of Israel. There are Gentiles out there. We know who um, true Israel is. And I'll be doing a video on who true Israel is. It's not the the Israel that you see over in the Middle East. It's, it's not those people. True Israel is somebody totally different that's been hidden under the radar. And we'll get into that later on. Um, but. Most people are, are starting to figure out who true Israel is um, and where they come from. They didn't come from the Middle East like we've been told. But let's get back to this. Let's get back to polluting his holy name no more with gift giving and with idolatry. 
because what Israel was doing was Israel was taking the name of the most high in vain and giving gifts to their idols. They were gift giving to the idols and replaced everything that the most high said. So they replaced the holy days and they started doing pagan days. They started doing pagan worship and they started doing pagan gift giving. Even back then, remember, there is nothing new under the sun as it was in the old days. It is now. So now that we know that, here's what I want to do. I want to show you how. And, you know, I have a, a pure hatred for um, the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there's no love between us because they have been the mother of harlots and have caused his people to cause um, whoredoms idolatry and everything under the sun and they have led his true people to that point so what i want to show today is i want to show you how the roman empire uh taught us this stuff and we're going to look up who the roman empire worshipped because remember all roads always lead to rome and when they're involved you'll notice that there's a pathway that leads to all things that involve anything that's going on that's evil, that's corrupt. All roads always leads to Rome. So that's the reason I said I'm going to come at it at a different way because I want to show you how Rome has caused us to commit whoredoms and commit pagan practices against the Most High. So that's what we're going to do. What we're, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to show you who their God was. And we're going to do a Google search. So we're going to use Google a lot today. Um, and it's important because it's important to know what Rome actually believes in this. I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. So this is the. The 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 uh, there's a lot of Catholics out there. I hope you're listening to this video. There's a lot of Christians out there. I hope you're listening to this video because Christian is what people don't understand is Christianity is just a division of the Roman Catholic Church because most people keep forgetting that the only reason you know about Christianity is because Rome, when they brought us over here through the transatlantic slave trade, they converted everybody to Christians and to Christianity. Thus, the reason why Christianity is the leading religion in the United States because they and, and in the islands because they introduced it. Christianity and the Catholic Church are the exact same thing. So let's go to Google. Let's find out. And let's see how we can connect Rome to it and bring it all the way back to a full circle. Back to Christmas because that's what we're talking about. Let's go to Google right now. All right. We're here at Google.com. And what I want to do is I want to do a search. So, like I said, I know about how Rome is involved. I'm going to put in, and this is something you probably never knew. I'm going to put in this word here. It's called soul invict. Soul invictus. And I want you to see what Sol Invictus is. So we see these pictures here. But let's read what Sol Invictus actually is. Sol Invictus, unconquered sun, was the official sun god of the later Roman Empire and a patron of soldiers. The god was favored by emperors after Aurelian and, and appeared on their coins until the last third part of the reign of Constantine the first. Now you're probably like, yeah, what does that have to do with Christmas about Sol Invictus? Well, I'm going to show you. So we see here Sol Invictus. We see here the different statues and different things like that. But we see that this was their official sun god of the later Roman Empire. And it, the sun god was called the unconquered sun. So let's go back 
and go to the search and what I want to do is I want to put in Soul Invictus birthday and click search and here's where the party starts when is Soul Invictus birthday December 25th this is when it is December 25th the Roman festival of Sun God Soul Invictus there's the connection right there December 25th Christmas so today December 25th is the day in the later Roman Empire when people celebrated the winter solstice and the birthday of the Sun God Soul Invictus the day was called Dies Natalis Invicti. Now we need to know what Dies Natali, Natalis Victi means, but I'm going I'm to pause right there because I'm actually what I want to show you is, is what the winter solstice is. Winter solstice. Let's see what we get here. So winter solstice. Actually, let me do this. What is the winter solstice? Let me type that in. What is winter solstice? That's good enough. Okay. Let's see what we get. Just a quick. Okay. The winter solstice. Hymo solstice or hibernal solstice. Also known as midwinter. Occurs when one of the Earth's poles has its maximum tilt away from the sun. It happens twice yearly, once in each hemisphere. Now, of course, we know the Earth doesn't tilt because the Earth is flat. Uh, if you don't know that, read your Bible. There's over 100 scriptures that talks about the Earth being stationary, the sun moving around the Earth, not the, the, the Earth moving around the sun. Um, you're either going to believe the Bible or you're going to believe what science says. Um, remember that it says, uh, I, I think it's in uh, Philippians, be wary of science as they so falsely say because science deceives so be wary of science so that's what the solstice is we've all we've seen that now there's a, a important word that I want you to remember in here in the solstice uh, if you look down it says date celebration significance um, the significance astronomically marks the beginning of lengthening days and shortening nights next one is called also called midwinter Yule. I want you to remember that word Yule. Y-U-L-E. Yule. Now, let's do this. Let's remember where I say I want to go back to when it says Dies Natalis Solstice. Let's find out what that Dies Natalis means. Uh, let's go back here. So, let's go Dies uh, Natalis. I see it right there. Dies Natalis meaning. Let's look this up right here. Dies Natalis is Latin for birthday. So Dies Natalis means the birthday of the solstice. Let's see. Dies Natalis is Latin for birthday, anniversary, and may refer to the birthday of an individual or the anniversary of a founding event. Um, example of a university, see Glass Glossary of Ancient Roman Religion, Dies Natalis. Dies Natalis Solis Invicti. The birthday of the Roman solar deity Sol Invictus on December 25th. So when you hear people say Dies Natalis Solis Invicti, that's the birthday of the Roman solar deity Sol Invictus. And that birthday is on December 25th. Now I'm sure you never knew that. So you realize what we're getting into right now. What we're getting into is sun worship. You all never knew that. I never knew that until I started investigating. Now let's see what a uh, soul invictus means in Latin. Let's let's look that up. So soul and victus in Latin. Soul invictus means invincible sun the invincible sun 
So, this is their sun god, the invincible sun. I just wanted you all to see that. Invincible sun. Now, I wanted to point out that this is sun worship. Because what is the one thing that the Most High hated out of everything of any idol worship? He hated sun worship. Sun worship has been the foundation of all worship. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 15 through 18 and read all about it. Let's go there right now. All right. Here we are in Ezekiel chapter 8. But what I want to do is I want to start at verse 10. So we'll read verses 10 through 18. Because I think this is important to start a little bit early, just so you can read the whole story. So here's what it says. It says, so I went in and saw and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jazaniah, the son of Shaphan. With every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imaginary? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. So they're like, Hey, he's not even watching. We can go ahead and do this. Verse 13. He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. So now, that's the reason I wanted to go a little early. It's because he's showing you each level of abomination that they do. And each time he goes to the next one, it's something greater, a greater abomination. So watch this. So we're going to start reading. So we already see. That they did things in the dark. Every man in his chambers. So we saw that already. So verse 14 says. Uh, let's go here. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. Which was toward the north. And behold there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Ah, now. <laughs> I'm gonna, actually, I'm going to pause right there. Up, little icon coming up. I'm going to pause right there because I wasn't going to do a search and I wasn't going to even deal with Tammuz, but I just want to show you something about Tammuz. I'm going to switch over real quick. I'm going to go back to Google. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to type in Tammuz birthday. When is Tammuz birthday? I just want you to I just want you to see right here. When is Tammuz birthday? December twenty fifth. So you're gonna learn a lot about this this Christmas holiday and and how it goes. So we can see right here. That Tammuz's birthday is December 25th. Remember I said nothing new under the sun? Tammuz goes all the way back to the ancient Bible. All the way back to Ezekiel and beyond Ezekiel. So, actually, Tammuz actually goes all the way back to Genesis. To the first book of the Bible. That's how far Tammuz goes back. So, we're talking ancient uh, ancient paganism and already you should see where I'm going at before I even get done with telling you anything else you should see already where I'm going at so let's get through reading so they saw him verse 14 I'll read that again then he brought me to the door of the gates of the Lord's house which was toward the north and behold there sat women weeping for Tammuz now watch this verse 15 then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater 
abominations the knees. So this is already abomination that he's they're weeping to Tammuz. Now they're about to see something greater. Verse 16. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. What does it say? And they worshipped the sun toward the east. Now we get into that sun worship. Sol Invictus. Sun worship. And then we get to verse 17 and verse 18. It says, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. I'm going to stop on that provoking me to anger. So we see they did all these abominations, but then they got down to the 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 bang do la the 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 mother of all mother abominations that he just absolutely detest what was that it was sun worship verse 16 that last part says and they worshiped the sun toward the east soul invictus december 25th the birth they the birthday of the invincible sun, Sol Invictus, the sun god. So, back to verse 17. It says, Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Verse 18. Therefore, will I also deal in fury. Mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Wow. So he said it got so bad that Judah, the house of Judah, started doing sun worship it was so bad that he said i'll hear them scream out my name when they're in pain when they're in in in, in calamity and i'll close my ears toward them because they've done this evil abomination this great abomination to me and worship the sun december 25th christmas Attached to Sol Invictus. Now that we've established that Rome has made the birth of our Messiah and have attached his name to it, December 25th. So they, they've attached the name of, of, of Christmas and, and put, put, put Christ in Christmas. But they've attached it to the Sol Invictus, the invincible uh, a son and have made his birth with the sun god it's, it's just ridiculous um and actually i'm a i'm a i'm a pause right there because most people they're like that's when when uh they say jesus of course i've, I've done a whole lesson on why i don't call him jesus yahawashai and people are like that's when he was born december 25th I can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt through the word of God when he was actually born. Because people act like they don't know when he was born. It's very easy to pinpoint when he was born if you actually understand the scriptures. So I'm just going to take a little a side journey right here. I'm going to take a side journey just so you know when he was actually born. And, and it's going to blow your mind because when I, when I first uh, 
learned about it and start reading it. I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know why I didn't notice it. But the reason I notice it now is because I practice all of his um, feast and holy days. So now I actually know when he was born. And if, if you start going through his feast and holy days, you'll know when he was born too, or when he was born too. So he wasn't born on December 25th. He was actually born in a different month. Um, okay, let me start this this way. And I'm not going to, you'll look up the scriptures. You'll know what scriptures I'm talking about. You can go to it and look it up yourself. But I'm just going to talk this through real quick. Here's what we do know. When when the Messiah was 30 years old, was the beginning of his uh, ministry, Correct. When he was crucified, he was 33 years old when he was crucified. He got crucified in the Passover. Now, the date of the Passover is pretty much correct. It's when new life happens. That's in March. That's one of the first celebrations and that's actually when the new year of god's calendar is is when spring happens there's new life so this new year's that we see right now is not a real new year's actually if you if you know where new year's actually came from it's a, a another pagan um holiday because it's in the dead of winter new year's actually started in germany so the whole new year's and new year's eve is 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 a german uh thing too so new year's eve and new matter of fact let me just let me just go to this real quick let me go to google here's what i'm gonna, I'm gonna type in um i'm gonna type in the word sylvester sylvester let me see sylvester in english there we go new year's eve Notice it says German. See where it says Sylvester German? Because it was, uh, let's see if I can even read about it. I'm, I'm just going off the cuff right now. Um, English translation of Sylvester. German English Dictionary. English translation of Sylvester. The official Collins German English Dictionary online. Because most people don't know Sylvester, it was a uh, a pope or something like that who came up with New Year's Eve, this whole New Year's and the whole thing that we do with the resolutions on New Year's. So we write this down. It's all a part of Christmas, actually. It was it was part of the winter solstice and they would conquer people. And so what they would do is they would write down goals of who they were going to conquer for the next year. That's where we get our New Year's resolution or New Year's Eve resolution. And people write down their goals and they make new um, new resolutions for the new year. This is what they did. All German, all pagan. So I just want to say, take that side note. Back uh, to the other thing. Let's go back to what I was talking about, about the birth of Christ. Um, what most people don't know, like I said, with the birth of Christ, he was 30 years old when he started his ministry. So we got that. His ministry was three and a half years until his death. So we got that. He died what we call Easter, which is another pagan holiday. But that's where the Passover or spring or the new year starts biblically. And it's right around in, Mar in March area. That's why it's every year the date kind of change. It's when the new, when the, well, I guess what we call the full moon which is actually the new moon. When that new moon happens in March, that's when the new year begins. So all you have to do is reverse. Take three years, subtract. We're still in March. Take six months and reverse it. So March, February, January, December, November, let's see, October. So we come to October, the month of October. And you're like, well, how can you verify that? 
how can you verify that it was in October according to our calendar? Well, let's see. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Okay, October. Now, according to Yah's calendar, like I said, March is his month. Let me see. March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. Here's the reason why it can be reversed. If you look at the birth of Jesus, remember, we all know the story. It says there was no room in the end. If you look at the entire scripture, there was a festival going on in Jerusalem during that time where all the rooms were booked. So they had to go to a manger because there was no room in the end. Well, guess what? There's only one festival that's held in the seventh month. And it's actually the seventh month and it starts on the 15th day and it lasts for a week. That festival is called the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is where everyone comes to Jerusalem. They rent out the hotels, which they call the inns. They rent them out and outside of their hotel or on top of the roofs of the hotels or inns, they build what's called booths and they dwell in the booths for the whole week and that whole week is just about giving thanks and praise to God people come from all over the country and they had to go to Jerusalem in order to do that actually if you look in the Old Testament the Feast of Tabernacles is still going to be celebrated uh, after judgment so after this is all done he does judgment it says every country every nation every year will come to the Feast of Tabernacles and if they don't come there'll be a curse on their land so the Feast of Tabernacles is an eternal covenant, but it's the it's in the seventh month, 15th day of his new year, which was in March. So we can count April, May, June, July, August, September, October, October, the seven months from March, October, the 15th. So, or, or the 15th day, according to his calendar. So, your Messiah, Yahawashai, was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. Not December 25th. He was born, if we had to use this Gregorian calendar, in October. Not in December. So, I just wanted to give that information to you. Go look at it yourself. And also the other telltale sign was, was shepherds in the wintertime, if you look in the Bible, they didn't stay with their flocks during the winter time because the winters were brutish and hard. They couldn't stand outside, especially at night. So before the sun went down, they would leave the field. But then that poses another problem because the other problem is it says that the, the shepherds, remember the whole three shepherds, they saw the star at night while they were they were herding their sheep. Well, how were they herding their sheep in wintertime? Because it says in the Bible that they don't herd their sheep in the wintertime at nighttime. So that's another telltale sign. So anyway. Let's get back on on Christmas. I just had to stop and and tell you that that his his birthday is not in December twenty. I guess it has a part to do with Christmas because they attach December twenty fifth to the birth of Christ, but it's really not the birth of Christ. It's really just they're they're making a mockery of him, and I, I just don't like it. So now that we've established that 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 Rome has made the birth of our Messiah a pagan holiday and places his his, his birth the same day as Sol Invictus, the Invincible Son which actually further sets up their sun worship kingdom and matches. That's it. It matches Sunday worship. So here we have Christmas, Sol Invictus, worshiping the invincible sun. That's Rome. And then we have Sunday worship, which worships the sun every Sunday. And then Christmas, which is 
Soul Invictus worshiping the sun. So it, I could stop this video right now. I don't even really need to go any further, but I am because there's even more information. Like I said, this is going to be a long video, so you might have to take a break. <laughs> you might have to come back um, to it, but I'm going to lay this whole thing down because I, I don't I, I don't like people being deceived. I, I hate being deceived. I like knowing the truth and I like to know what I'm getting myself into as one who likes to follow the most high. And I don't want to live my whole life living a lie, celebrating uh, Christmas and doing all this stuff and, and don't even realize that I'm just in an a, a illusion that was placed on me because I failed to get knowledge. Remember the most high said my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge knowledge because they won't understand and fear me so i'm just putting the fear in christmas that's what i'm doing i'm putting the fear in christmas so if you want to know what i'm doing i'm putting the fear in christmas so let's find out where this elaborate christmas holiday came from and where it gets its origin so we starting to get we starting to get there right now so i'm going to go back to google and here's what i'm gonna do I'm going to put in, remember that word I told you before? Uh, we saw that word Yule. The whole name is called Yuletide. So let's put in, what is Yuletide? This is where it starts getting fun, uh, fun at. So we see Yuletide. Archaic term for Christmas. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, wow, Yule Tide. Here we go. Uh, Yule. So you see what the Yule is. You see what is Yule Tide. What does it have to do with Christmas in that photo up there? Uh, we see the guy in the left with all the green little evergreen trees and, and different things on them. But let's read right here. It says Yule or Yule Tide. Yule time or Yule season is a festival historically observed by the Germanic people. So we're back to Germany. Remember, I showed you Sylvester in English. It also had German terms. So now we're starting to attach Germany. And and you're like, but, but you were talking about Rome. Oh, just wait for it. I'm going to show you how Germany and Rome are attached. You're, you're going you're to be shocked when you find out. So I am talking about Rome and Roman Empire, but now we're dealing with Germany. And I will show you where the attachment comes, I said I'm going to go full circle all the way back around. And it's going to lead right back to Rome. So once again, Yule or Yuletide, Yule time or Yule season, is a festival historically observed by the Germanic peoples. Terms with an etymological equivalent to Yule are, used, are still used in Nordic countries and Estonia to describe Christmas. See? So Yuletide or Yuletide is christmas and other festivals occurring during the winter holiday season um let me click the i'll click the wikipedia let's see what they're saying in here okay we just got to read that oh oh yeah 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 yeah. you tide or you time you is a festival historically observed by the germanic people scholars have connected the original celebrations of yule to the wild hunt the god odin Does that name sound familiar? Odin? Remember Thor? Thor's father? Odin? you like, hold on for a second. Now, wait a minute. I watched Thor. I know who Odin is. Odin is that old dude that kept going to sleep. Oh, we're going to learn about Odin. Let's, let's do this. Let's go back to... Ah, yeah. Let's do this. Here's what I want to do. Uh... I'm going to go back. I'm going to put in, let's see. Let's find out about Odin. I'm going to type in Odin Yule story. Because we need to know how did Odin get attached to Yule, which is Christmas. Right here. Is Santa actually based on Odin? 
Norse Yule Origins of Christmas, Sons of Vikings. During Yule, all the gods are honored, especially Odin, who is also, let's see, to the Santa story, 1823, through a poem, a visit from St. Nicholas. So hold on for a second. Odin? Is Saint Nick? Don't take Odin out of Yule. Let's see. Odin atop his eight-legged steed. Hold on for a second. Aren't there eight reindeer? And Odin has an eight-legged steed called Slepner. In pagan times, the pair would ride at Yule terrifying those who dare to be out but also bringing candy and toys to children more replaced Slepner with eight flying reindeer in his 18th century poem and the image stuck so here's what I want to do Let's go. There we go. You wanted to know who Santa Claus was. There's your Santa Claus. Odin. Thor's pappy. Like he say, I should pappy. There's your pappy right there. Odin. Santa Claus. Saint Nick. Odin. That's that's your pappy right there. Let me see what else. I'm just looking at a couple of the images here. Oh, let's let's look at this one here. Irrefutable proof that Santa is Odin. Santa, known for serial trespassing and an unnatural interest in children. Odin, known for filling the seeds with blood of his murdered great grandfather. You know him, you love him, you probably sat on his lap and left cookies. But Santa Claus, that jolly fat man known worldwide for spreading Christmas joy to well-behaved children, has a dark secret. Santa had another gig long before he donned the red suit. Santa is, in fact, Odin, the Desido king of the Norse god. And here's the irrefutable proof. Go on, Timmy, sit on Santa's lap. But Santa smells like mead and brimstone. Young children instinctively know of Santa's sketchy past. So, I want to actually, uh, that's, that's, that's on the pictures. I'm not going to click on that. But more than it, oh, this is a good picture. So we can see he had an eight-legged steed. Four in the front, four in the back. And on December 25th, he rode in the air. So all they did was take Odin and replace him and made him a sleigh and gave him reindeer. So I just want to I just want to show you that. Let me let me see. I'm just trying to read some more things. The Vikings had a rich culture of uh, belief uh, system. Chief among Norse gods was Odin, the god of wisdom, magic, poetry, and war. Actually, many of the Viking gods were gods of war. Vikings really liked war. In the Norse creation myth, Odin slew the original god, Ymir, who was also Odin's great-grandfather. From Ymir's corpse, Odin created the world, the oceans, and blood, mountains from his bones, the heavens from his skull. Odin spent most of his time in pursuit of wisdom, a quest of which he sacrificed an eye and even hung himself by the neck for nine days. Odin was often depicted as a wandering old wizard with a long white beard. Tolkien used this image of Odin, the Grey Wanderer, as the basis of Gandalf the Grey. So, I'm just going over, just reading a couple of things, only because I wanted to know a little bit more about Odin. This is the last one I look at. Norse tradition was passed through storytelling, poetry, and song. So when Christianity 
blitzed its way across Viking territory like well, like Vikings, it was easy for this new belief system to supplant Norse culture. But the Norse traditions are still there, right beneath the surface. We invoke the names of the Norse deities on a daily basis. Now, I'm glad it's going over this because I want to show you this. Like, Wednesday is Odin's Day. Thursday is his son's day called Thor's Day. And Friday is Freya's Day, which is his wife, or Freak's Day. So most people don't know that every day of the week is named after some pay, pagan deity. Monday is Moon Day. Tuesday is Tweez Day, which is another god. And like I said, Wednesday is uh, Odin's Day. Woden's or Odin's Day. Thurs, Thursday is Thor's Day. Thor's Day. Friday is Freya's Day, which is the wife of, of, of um, Odin, the mother of Thor. Saturday is Saturn's Day. And, of course, we all know Sunday is the day of the sun. Sun day. So, just uh, going over that right there. Um, that's all I need to go. Oh, let's see. I'm going to read right down here. Uh, right here it says, and we celebrate the winter solstice. Oh, no, no, let's read up. Many still celebrate the spring equinox, the Norse way, paying homage to Eoster, which is Easter. So, there's another connection with the Norse, the Germanic Norse people. So Easter or Easter with rabbits and point uh, and painted eggs. We celebrate the fall equinox by dressing as dead and carving faces into gourds. They're, they're talking about Halloween, of course. And we celebrate the winter solstice, much as the Vikings celebrated Yule by caroling. And decorating our homes with evergreens. Then we get into the tree. Of course, Yule celebrations also included Odin. And Odin's rolling Yule is what gave us our beloved Santa Claus. So I just wanted to show you. Santa Claus. Odin. Alright, I think we, we good on that. And you all got that right there. So we've established who Santa really is, where his reindeer flying through the sky came from, and where gift giving came from. So, you know what? I just thought about this too. And actually, I'll, I'll do this. I'll do this once I I, I do a Christmas tree. Let me let me Google Christmas tree real quick. Let's let's do that real quick. Uh, no, uh, just Christmas tree origin. Let me see what we come up with here. So we got the Christmas tree. Um, let's see here. I'm just looking down. Uh, oh, history channel. Let's see. Christmas tree from Germany. Germany. See, I did not tell you Germany. Germany and Rome. So I'm gonna make the connection, but here we go with Germany again. Christmas trees from Germany. Germany is credited with starting the Christmas tree tradition as we know it in the 16th century when devout Christians. There's the connection. There's your connection. We're here's the connection we're making. When devout Christians brought decorated trees into their homes, some built Christmas pyramids of wood. And decorated them with evergreens and candles if wood was scarce. Uh, let me. I'm gonna just click on the History Channel. So we got the tree. I'm just trying to scroll through here. Don't mind me. I'm just looking. Um, this is what I want to read. The history of Christmas tree goes back to the symbolic use of evergreens in ancient Egypt and Rome. There's your connection. So you wanted to know how it's going to go full circle. Here's your connection. The Christmas tree was used in ancient or evergreens in ancient Egypt and Rome and continues with the German tradition of candlelit Christmas trees first brought to America in the 1800s. Now, how was this brought to America? 
Who conquered America? The Spaniards. Who are the Sp Spain? Spaniards, Spain, Rome. Once again, the discovery of the Christmas tree from the earliest winter solstice celebrations to Queen Victoria's decorating habits and the annual lighting of the Rockefeller Center tree in New York City. So we see already where Christmas came from, where the tree came from. And here's the problem with the Christmas tree. Long before the advent of Christianity, plants and trees that remain green all year had a special meaning for people in the winter. Just as people today decorate their homes during the festive season with pine, spruce, firs, trees, ancient people hung evergreen bowls over their doors and windows. In many countries, it was believed that evergreens would keep away witches, ghosts, evil spirits, and illness. Pagan practices. Pagan practices. I'm um, just scrolling down. Just, just want to see if there's anything else I want to. Uh, they talk about the winter solstice. Northern Hemisphere, the shortest day and longest night of, of the year falls on December 21st or 22nd. And it's called the winter solstice. Many ancient people believed that the sun was a god and that the winter came every year because the sun god had become sick and weak. They celebrated the solstice because it meant that at last the sun god would begin to get well. Evergreen bowls reminded them of all the green plants that would grow again when the sun got was strong and summer would return. Now, I'm going to pause right here. Do you remember that scene? I don't know if you all seen the movie Thor, but, the, but I'm, I'm putting on your thinking caps. You remember that scene in Thor where Odin had to go to sleep and during his, summer, uh, his slumber, he was weak? It was his weakest time. And if you think about it too, what was Loki the god of? Of the cold. So right there, you see the frost, the frost god, Loki, working with the frost god, was trying to take out Odin because Odin is the sun god and Odin was asleep during his weakest time. And the weakest time is during the winter solstice. And so Loki was trying to take him out. But then during his birthday, December 25th, that's when the sun is reborn. That's when Odin awakened. Because during that time, the sun starts to come back around for another season. He was reborn. During the season of the sun. And the sun began December 25th. That's when Odin awakened. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? And that's when Odin was reborn. And could rule for another whole year. Until he had to go back to sleep again. Because of the winter solstice. They throw stuff like this in movies all the time. They throw it in our face. They got us watching these type of movies. We're cheering on Thor. We're cheering on Odin. We're like, boo, uh, Loki, and yay, Thor, and yay, Odin. Not realizing that's also pagan worship. They throw in paganism in movies. They're throwing it in our faces, making us worship deities that we were never meant to worship. We weren't made to worship Odin. We weren't made to worship Thor, Loki, any of them. But that's what they keep putting in our faces. And then what they put in our faces, most of all, is this Christmas. So now let's get to root. Let's get to the uh, let's get to the root of this sun god worship, because here's what we need to know. We need to know when did it start? How did this whole thing start? We see in the Bible that it was talking about um, he hates sun worship. But when did sun worship actually start? In biblical history. That's what we want to know. And I can tell you. Where it started from. So what I'm going to do is. I keep doing that by mistake. Let's see. I'm going to go back. In here. And I'm going to show you where it started at. Because I know the guy's name. 
and you probably know him. His name is Nimrod. You know this guy? Right here. So Nimrod. Nimrod and his mother were the originators of this worship upon earth. So now we got Christmas going all the way because Sol Invictus, December 25th. Now we got Nimrod, who was, uh, let me just get to read this. Now I'm going to talk about this Nimrod. Nimrod and his mother were the originators of this worship upon earth. Mithras, not gonna even, I'm not going to even get on Mithras yet. I, I, you, I'll get on that later. Known as the a god of light was regarded as a sun god or rather as the unconquerable sun god sounds sounds uh very um familiar right remember soul invictus the invincible sun god the unconquerable right here sun god this was adopted by the holy roman empire didn't i tell you all roads leads to rome as the worship of mary as the Madonna and child. This this picture right here. The Madonna child. Right there. That worship. That's what they were doing. And just showing you a picture of. Of Nimrod right here. The first human sun god. Born on what date? December 25th. Nimrod of ancient Babylonian. The Lord of Christmas. I hope I'm putting some godly, 100% unfiltered fear inside of you about this Christmas. I, I, I really hope I am. Because you need to see how evil this holiday, this hell a day, that's what I call it, this hell a day, really is. So we see that Nimrod is the foundation. So let's do this. I told you just, hey, you might need to take another break right here, but I'm about to get into some deep stuff about Nimrod. Let's find out everything we can about this guy named Nimrod. Let's find out about Nimrod now. So I'm going to, and, and here's, if you have a uh, the Apocrypha, I need to go to the Apocrypha because what happens is in the King James Version Bible, you see Nim, the word Nimrod mentioned a couple of times. Or right, let me say this again. In the King James Version Bible, the, the, the newest version that we have right now that was in 1802, Nimrod is only mentioned a couple of times. But if you go back to the King James Bible 1611, where there were 15 more books in it, because the regular King James now only has 66 books. The 1611 version of the King James Bible, the same Bible you have, had 16 or 15 more books. It was 81 books in that Bible. 81. Now we're dwindled down to 66, which is why I don't understand why people keep saying it's the infallible word of God. Well, how is it infallible if you took out 15 books? It can't be infallible because the Roman Catholic Church decided to take out 15 books. Because they wanted to hide stuff. And here's one of the things they want to hide. This is why I want to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to find out about Nimrod. And you're about to be amazed at some of these things that I tell you right now. So let's go to Jasher chapter 7 verses 25 to 33. This is in the Apocrypha. So if you have an Apocrypha, uh, if not, just look at the screen. All right, go into there now. All right, Jasher chapter 7. Verses 25 through 33. And we're going to dissect this nicely. We're going to go slowly because there's going to be some things in here that is going to blow your mind that you did not know. If you know anything about the Bible, you're about to be very surprised because I was surprised. So here we go. We're about to learn about Nimrod. Verse 25. For after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch. Now I'm going to stop right there. Remember, that the Most High, after they sinned, he made Adam uh, outfit, Adam and Eve an outfit. He made Adam this 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 uh, suit or 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 coat or whatever it was. 
Well, for some reason, this coat had was was anointed because, of course, it was made by the most high. I, I don't know why I would say because, but it was made. It's the only clothing that we know that was made by the most high, this this clothing. So if he made it, you know, it had some type of power or some type of uh, anointing on it that was infused in it. So this is the most important clothing in the entire world. So let's read it again. For after the death of Adam and his wife, the garments were given to Enoch, the son of Jared. And when Enoch was taken up to God, he gave them to Methuselah, his son. And at the death of Methuselah, Noah took them and brought them to the ark. And they were with him until he went out of the ark. And in their going out, here we go. Ham stole those garments from Noah, his father. And he took them and hid them from his brothers. So we got evil old Ham, the one who who knew his father's nakedness. I'm not, I'm, I'll go over that later on about he saw his father naked. It was more to that story. Verse 28. And when Ham begat his firstborn Cush, he gave him the garments in secret. And they were in with Cush many days. So you see that they he done stole Adam's garment from Noah and, and now he done gave it to his son Cush. Verse 29. And Cush also concealed them from his sons and brothers. And when Cush had begotten Nimrod, Nimrod, he gave him those garments through his love for him. And Nimrod grew up and when he was 20 years old, he put on those garments. Let's see what happened when he put it on. And Nimrod became strong when he put on those garments. Remember I told you there was something with the garment that, that the Most High made for Adam. That there was an anointing on it. So it amplified who Nimrod was. He became strong when he put on those garments. And God gave him might and strength. And he was a mighty hunter in the earth. Yea, he was a mighty hunter in the in the field and he hunted the animals and he built altars and he offered upon them the animals before the Lord and Nimrod strengthened himself and he rose up from among his brethren and he fought the battles of his brethren against all the enemies round about and the Lord delivered all the enemies of his brethren in his hands and God prospered him from time to time in his battles and he reigned upon the earth he reigned the mighty hunter Therefore, it became current in those days when a man ushered forth those that he had trained up for battle. He would say to them, like God did to Nimrod, who was a mighty hunter in the earth and who succeeded in battles that prevailed against his brethren, that he delivered them from the hands of their enemy. So may God strengthen us and deliver us this day. So we, dis we see here that Nimrod became a mighty hun uh, hunter during this time, which is where we get the term deer hunter, because that's what they used to call him. They said he was a deer hunter, but what you don't understand, the deer were men that he was hunting. You'll learn all about that later on as I keep reading. But Nimrod was known as the mighty hunter and a deer hunter, but he was a hunter of men. So I'm about to go down to verse 44 through 46 in the same chapter. Listen right here. And Nimrod dwelt in Shinar and he reigned securely and he fought with his enemies and he subdued them and he prospered in all his battles and his kingdom became very great. And all nations and tongues heard of his fame and they gathered themselves to him and they bowed down to the earth and they brought him offerings and he became their Lord and king. And they all dwelt with him in the city at Shinar and Nimrod reigned in the earth over all the sons of Noah. Remember, there was nobody else on the earth but Noah, Ham, Shem and Japheth. But he reigned over all the sons of Noah, and they were all under his power and counsel. 
And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. But Nimrod did not go in the ways of the Lord. And he was more wicked than all the men that were before him from the days of the flood until those days. So what we just learned is Nimrod became the most wickedest man alive in the sight of the Most High. And he became a hunter. So he became a hunter. Now let's prove that he became a hunter. He became a hunter, a hunter of men. We're going to go to Jasher 920. And I'm just going to go ahead and forward this. Jasher 920. Let's go to it right here. It says, And King Nimrod reigned securely, and all the earth was under his control. And all the earth was of one tongue and words of union. So here we see Nimrod became king of the earth. So he was the king of the entire earth. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to Jasher 29 verse 39. And we're going to learn something very important here. 29 through 39. So let's start right there at verse 29. It says, And the Lord knew their thoughts. And it came to pass when they were building, they cast the arrows toward heaven. Now, what, what is he talking about right here? What he's talking about right here is Nimrod starting to build the tower. Remember, there was a tower built to heaven. So this is the story of Nimrod starting to build this tower. Now, remember, Nimrod was evil. And we're about to see how Babylon got started. And where Babel came from. So verse 29 again. And the Lord knew their thoughts. And it came to pass. When they were building. They cast the arrows toward heaven. And all the arrows fell upon them. Filled, uh, and all the arrows fell upon them. Filled with blood. And when they saw them. They said to each other. Surely we have slain all those that are in heaven. For this was from the Lord. In order to cause them to err. And in order to destroy them from the off the face of the ground. And they built the tower and the city. And they did this thing daily until many days and years were elapsed. And God, the most high, said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him, to those who were near to him, saying, come, let us descend and confuse their tongues. That one man shall not understand the language of his neighbor. And they did so unto him. And from that day following, they forgot each man his neighbor's tongues. And they could not understand to speak in one tongue. And when the builder took from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone, which he did not order, the builder would cast it away. And throw it upon his neighbor that he would die. And they did so many days and they killed many of them in this manner. And the Lord smote the three divisions that were there and he punished them according to their works and designs. Those who said we will ascend to heaven and serve our gods became like apes and elephants. And those who said we will smite the heaven with arrows. The Lord killed them. One man through the hand of his neighbor and the third division of those who said, we will ascend to heaven and fight against him. The Lord scattered them throughout the earth and those who were left amongst them. When they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. They ceased building the city and the tower. Therefore, he called that place Babel. So that's where we get the word Babel. For there the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Behold, it was at the east of the land of Shinar. And as to the tower which sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up one third part thereof. And a fire also descended from heaven and burned another third. And the other third is left to this day. And it is of that part which was aloft, and its circumference is three days walk. And many of the sons of men died in that tower, a people without number. 
So we see here in this verse, this is where Babel started. The confusion of language. Thus where Babylon came from. Now, we're going to show you where Nimrod's wickedness spread across the world. I'm going to go to Jasher 11, verses 7 through 8. Right here, it says, And notwithstanding this, Nimrod did not return to the Lord. And he continued in wickedness and teaching wickedness to the sons of men. And Mardon, his son, was worse than his father and continued to add to the abominations of his father. And he caused the sons of men to sin. Therefore, it is said, from the wicked goeth forth wickedness. So we see Nimrod's wickedness spreads across the entire world. Now, here is where it gets interesting and some things you did not know. I know those things you didn't know. You didn't. Some people don't know that Nimrod tried to go to heaven to open up the gates of heaven that are up there to make war with the Most High. Most people don't even realize that. But here's another thing that I didn't know that I learned when I started reading the Apocrypha about Nimrod. Nimrod tried to kill Abraham. Because of a prophecy that said Abraham's seed would kill Nimrod. This is where it gets interesting. It's Jasher 11. We're going to go there. Jasher uh, chapter 35. Let me get to it. 35. And verse 6. Right here. It says, Surely he delivered their father Abraham, the Hebrew, from the hand of Nimrod. And from the hand of all the people who had many times sought to slay him. So I'm not going to go over that whole story because I could be reading forever about how Nimrod tried to kill Abraham because of this prophecy. Um, his father lied. They, it Actually, Nimrod thought that he killed Abraham when he was a young boy and dashed his head against a stone and killed him. But he didn't realize that the boy that he killed was a, a, a decoy and that they took Abraham and hid him. For many years against uh, Nimrod. So you can go in Jasher. Just go back to the uh, book of Jasher. And read about that. I don't I don't want to go there. Because uh, like I said. We can be reading forever about this story. But what I do want to go to. Is the death of Nimrod. And here is where we go. Full circle. This is where it gets freaking interesting. And this is going to surprise you because it surprised the heck out of me. Jasher chapter 27. Let's go there. I'm going to just go ahead right here. We're already here. Jasher 27. I'm about to read. Uh, I'm going to read this whole chapter. This dude, watch this. And Esau at that time, after the death of Abraham, frequently went in the field to hunt. And Nimrod, hold on for a second. I never knew, nobody never knew Nimrod met Esau. Never mentioned in the, in the King James Version. Never mentioned that. Didn't, nobody knew Nimrod met Esau. Watch this. And Nimrod, king of Babel, the same was Amraphel, also frequently went with his mighty men to hunt in the field and to walk about with his men in the cool of the day. And Nimrod was observing Esau all the days for a jealousy was formed in the heart of Nimrod against Esau all the days. What? Verse four. And on a certain day, Esau went in the field to hunt and he found Nimrod walking in the wilderness with his two men. And all his mighty men and his people were with him in the wilderness. But they removed at, they removed at a distance from him. And they went from him in different directions to hunt. And Esau concealed himself for Nimrod. And he lurked for him in the wilderness. And Nimrod and his men that were with him did not know him. And Nimrod and his men frequently walked about in the field at the cool of the day. And to know where his men were hunting in the field. And Nimrod and, his two, and two of his men that were with him came to the place where they were when Esau started suddenly from his lurking place 
and drew his sword and hastened and ran to Nimrod and cut off his head. What the heck? Why didn't I know that Esau killed Nimrod? Why didn't you know that Esau killed Nimrod? Why has that information been hidden from us? Because it actually gets even deeper than this. I'm going to keep reading. There's Oh, there's more. I know you're probably shocked about this, but there's more. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. I got to I got to sing a Greece song right now. Verse eight. And Esau fought a desperate fight with the two men that were with Nimrod. And when they called out to him, Esau turned to them and smote them to death with his sword. And all the mighty men of Nimrod who had left him to go to the wilderness heard the cry at a distance and they knew the voice of those two men and they ran to know the cause of it. When they found their king and the two men that were with him lying dead in the wilderness. Verse 10. And when Esau saw the mighty men of Nimrod coming at a distance, he fled and thereby escaped. And Esau took the valuable garments. I'm, I, I took a long pause there because you don't understand. Some people don't understand. Listen, he took the valuable garments of Nimrod, which Nimrod's father had bequeathed to Nimrod and with which Nimrod prevailed over the whole land and he ran and concealed them in his house so hold before I even read any further hold on for the a freaking second a freaking freaking second so you telling me Adam's garment which the most high created that endued Adam with power, virtue, with the stature that was above everybody, that was passed down through Noah, Noah saved it during the flood, was stolen by Ham, given to his son Cush, who hid it from his brothers, then given to Nimrod, and when Nimrod put it on, Became a mighty hunter and ruled the whole earth through his wickedness. Now we have Esau. Who lurks in a bush or something. Comes and cuts off Nimrod's head. Kills his two dudes. Strips him. Takes the clothing. That was passed down. That was stolen also. But the outfit that the Most High created. Now it's in the hands of Esau. And you're like, man, what does this have to do with Christmas? Oh, you're going oh, you to learn today. you going to learn today. Let's keep reading. So now we see Esau has it. Verse 11. And Esau took those garments and ran into the city on account of Nimrod's men. And he came unto his father's house, wearied. And exhausted from the fight. Uh oh. And he was ready to die. Through grief. When he approached his brother Jacob. And sat before him. Y'all know where I'm going. Watch this. And he said to his brother Jacob. Behold. I shall die this day. And wherefore then. Do I want the birthright. And Jacob acted wisely with Esau in this matter. And Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. For it was so bought, brought about by the Lord. Why haven't you learned this in your regular Bible? Why was this story taken out? They made it just seem like Esau just came from hunting and he was tired. He was famished. Ain't had no water. It was like, oh, man, I'm hungry. I'm tired. Man, I just need some food. Can you give me some food? Where is you send me your birthright? Oh, man, I guess I'm, I'm about to die because I ain't had nothing to eat. Yeah, man, just 
Man, I go ahead and sell that food. I, Cause I always thought in my head, I'm like, why couldn't he just go in the house and ask, ask his mother, like, man, I'm tired. Can I just get some food? No. This dude just got out of a huge battle running for his life. Cause the guard, the other guards that wasn't with Nimrod, he, first of all, he cuts Nimrod's head off. You know, it was hard fighting Nimrod. Then he had fought two other guards. Then all their troops come and they start chasing him. And this dude running for his life, running for his life. We ain't talking about just he hung, running for his life. Then he, all, all this happens. He finally gets to Jacob. Of course, he's at the point of death now. This dude been running for his life. And he's like, I've, man, I just I got to get something to eat. I'm about to die. I've been I've been literally running for hours, running for my life. I, man, my birthright ain't, ain't nothing right now. I'm about to die anyway. If I don't get no food, I'm dying. That makes more sense now. That makes much more sense than the bull crap story that, that the Bible just gives us. And Esau came from, from hunting and he was like, ooh, I'm hungry. That makes more sense. But there's more. There's there's more shockers coming on. Let's keep reading. And Esau's portion in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abraham had bought from the children of Heth for possession of a burial ground, Esau also sold to Jacob. And Jacob bought all this from his brother Esau for value given. So we see that right there. And let's read this. And Jacob wrote the whole of this in a book. And he testified the same with witnesses. And he sealed it. And the book remained in the hands of Jacob. And when Nimrod, the son of Cush, died, his men lifted him up and brought him in consternation and buried him in his city. And all the days that Nimrod lived were 215 years. And he died. And the days that Nimrod reigned upon the people of the land were 185 years. And Nimrod died by the sword of Esau in shame and contempt. And the seed of Abraham caused his death as he had seen in his dream. That's why he wanted to kill Abraham because there was a vision of him being killed by Abraham's seed. And he was killed by Abraham's seed. He was killed by the seed of Esau. Last verse in here. And at the death of Nimrod, his kingdom became divided into many divisions. And all those parts that Nimrod reigned over were restored to their respective kings of the land, who recovered them after the death of Nimrod. And all the people of the house of Nimrod were for a long time enslaved to all the other kings of the land. Okay, so we see that Imrod, or Esau kills Nimrod and takes his mantle. And you're like, why is that so important about his mantle? Here's why. Let's go to Genesis. We're going to switch over here. I'm just going to do this. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 27. And we're going to read verses 39 through 40. So let's go there, 39 through 40. Yeah, that's where I want to go. All right, right here. So this is when, actually, let me, I'm going to read up just a little bit. Uh, oh, okay. Actually, let me, I'm going to read up. I'm going to read up just a little bit. Right here. I'm going to read up at verse 32. It says, And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And we know the story about Esau and Jacob. Jacob stole Esau's blessing because he dressed like he was Esau, put on skin like he was Esau. So Isaac gave the blessing to Jacob, which was rightfully so because Jacob actually owned Esau's birthright. So now we have Esau coming in here, and this is where the story picks up. Verse 33, and Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. 
yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with subtility, which that word subtility is deceit. And and I'm, I'm glad I pointed that word out right there, that deceit word. Because when you think about what's done to the true children of Israel today, the true Hebrews from the line of Shem, deceit has been brought on us. But remember, the Bible says that be not deceived, the Most High is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Jacob sowed deceit and took Esau's birthright. We have been hidden. We don't remember our, our language. We don't remember our culture. We don't remember where we came from. And the Bible talks about it. And there are other people who have taken our name, have take, put a false language there, the modern Hebrew, and a false city. And Revelations 2 and 9 says that there are Jews who are not Jews but do lie he said, I'm going to make them come and worship at your feet because there are Jews right now who are not really Jews. I'll leave that at that, but it's done through deceit. So they have taken the birthright of somebody else the same way that Jacob took the birthright of somebody else. Put those two clues together. and You'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. What Jacob sold is being reaped that harvest is, is 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 happening right now but it's not going to be forever just until the end let's keep going going back and read and he said verse 35 thy brother came with subtility and have taken away thy blessing and he said is not he rightly named jacob for he hath surplanted me these two times he took away my birthright and behold now he taketh away my blessing and he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? Right here is where I want to go. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Right here. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau, I'm going to read verse 41. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. Now, you, you might be saying, now how, how is that, how, what does that have to do with Christmas? Here's what it, here, it was, we're about to bring this full circle. So, with the blessing of Esau that Isaac gave to him, what most people don't realize, and from what we just learned, Esau took the mantle of Abraham from Nimrod, because Nimrod had it. He put on that mantle. When he put that mantle on, he put on the spirit of Nimrod. It was passed down to Esau. That spirit that Nimrod had in him was passed down to Esau. Remember, Nimrod was a man of war and lived by the sword. Look at verse 29. No, no, look at verse 40. It says, and by thy sword shalt thou live. 
But that was the same thing that Nimrod did. He lived by the sword. So we see Esau now living by the sword. So the blessing that Isaac bestowed to Esau was living by the sword. The same thing that Nimrod had. And he had the strength now of Nimrod. So, I know this video is long, but I just had to had to do this and bring this full circle around. So we're about to end right here and get toward the end. Here's what you know, got to know about Esau. Esau became Edom. And the Edomites, and I'm not I'm not going to go to any scripture on this. I want you to look some of this stuff up yourself. Esau became Edom and the Edomites. The Edomites became known as Romans. Most people don't know that, that the Edomites became known as the Romans. Ah, one more search. I'm going to do one more search. Let me see. If I can find this real quick. Uh, let me see. Idemia is romance. Let's see. Jewish um, encyclopedia. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to see if I can find this real quick just so you can see this is the Jewish encyclopedia that tells you about Edom Edom is the name which is given to Esau the firstborn of Isaac I just want to scroll down uh, some stuff I'm not going to read um, right here the use of the name the name Edom is used by the Talmudists for the Roman Empire and they apply to Rome every passage of the Bible referring to Edom or to Esau this is in the Jewish encyclopedia what they have done is that's why you you're like but I don't I didn't know that Romans were in the Old Testament oh they are and if you have the and, and this is what I just got I purchased the oldest Bible that was the oldest Old Testament Bible, which is called the Septuagint LXX, which is Septuagint 70, because it was tried by 70 people. They rewrote the entire thing. This is the, the Septuagint LXS, uh, LXX is the version of the Bible when you see in the New Testament said, and Jesus went to read the scriptures and he said, um, this day the scriptures happened and he closed the book. The book that he closed was the Septuagint LXX. He was reading from that version. That version is way before uh, his birth. It was 700 years before his birth. The King James Version that we have right now was 300 years after his death. And you're like, I don't understand. Why would they? Exactly. I don't understand either. The version of the Bible we have right now, the King James Version, is 300 years after his death. The Septuagint was 700 years after before his birth so that's something that you should look into is getting a Septuagint LXX it's the Old Testament and the Apocrypha only it's not the New Testament so for the New Testament you would still need um, a King James or a Sefer the Sefer Bible and those would be more accurate than the King James Version because they hide a lot of stuff as you can tell from all the stuff i've, re I've, I've um, read to you from the old king james the 1611 king james bible you can see that they're hiding stuff from us so i just want to point out again that edom we're reading again the name edom is used by the talmudists for the roman empire and they apply to rome every passage of the bible referring to edom or esau so I just want to show you that you can even go into and look into Esau's lineage. And what you'll find is you'll see that dukes and duchesses come from his lineage. Where are all the dukes and duchesses in Rome, England, over in the Spanish, Spaniard, Spanish area? 
So, put this full circle. We bring it full circle now. So, now we know that Edom, Esau, put on the mantle that Nimrod had. But Esau is Rome. So, Rome put on the mantle and received power. The power of Nimrod. And received the blessing that Nimrod had to bring others to subjection and to rule the world. Who rules the world right now? Just what you think about who rules the world right now. The Roman Catholic Church. Rome. Rome rules the world. Every country is pretty much subjugated to Rome. Even Britain with the queens and the duchesses are still ruled by Rome. If you look at Canada, most people don't realize that Canada is under the authority of the queen of England. The islands of the sea are also in America, the queen. But they're all owned by Rome. I told you all roads lead to Rome. So we know that Esau becomes Edom and the Edomites. The Edomites become known as Romans. They just hide their name. The Romans became the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church transformed the Saturnalia and Yuletide, because Yuletide comes from the Saturnalia, and this is the last uh, search I'll go ahead and do. We're going to go back to Google. Uh, let's see how I can pull this back up. Let's see what the Saturnalia is real quick. I'm just going to erase this. The Saturnalia or Saturnalia. Saturnalia, Saturnalia. Here we go. The Saturnalia was an ancient Roman festival in honor of the god Saturn held on December or 17th of December of the Julian calendar and later expanded with festivities through uh, through to December 23rd. Celebrations, feasting, role reversals, gift giving, and gambling. So what most people don't know about it is that it was the observance of the god Saturn. And right here, when did Saturnalia become Christmas? Christmas apparently started like Saturnalia in Rome and spread to the eastern Mediterranean. The earliest known reference to it commemorating the birth of Christ on December 25th is in the Roman Philokalian calendar. I don't need to go any further with this. No further with this. And you're like, but I put Christ in, in, in my Christmas. I I put Jesus in my Christmas. Well, let's let's do this then. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10 verses 1 through 5. Let's go there. All right, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. Let's read this. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it, deck the halls with boughs of jolly. They deck it with silver and with gold. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. Now, 
it's funny because some people read this and they're like, this isn't talking about Christmas. What this is talking about is they were building idols and they were decking the idols with silver and gold and putting them in their house and fastening them with nails. And so they argue this up and down to defend Christmas. Cool. You know what? I don't even argue with people over that anymore. I'm like, okay, cool. Let's, you want to take that? Cool. Then all I need is, is the first two verses. I don't even need anything else. Actually, verse 2 and 3. That's it. Verse 2 says, Thus said the Lord. Who said it? Thus said the Lord. Who said it? Thus said the Lord. Okay, so we know that the Most High said this. This is what the Most High said. Learn not the way of the heathen. Let's look up that word heathen. Gentiles. So he's talking to Israel. He said, learn not the ways of the Gentiles. Don't learn their ways. What is Esau? Esau is a Gentile. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. How can Esau be a Gentile? But he was born from Abraham. He's a Hebrew. Yes, he is a Hebrew. But what most people don't know and we're going to, I'll do, I'm going to, my neck, probably my next, uh, next, in the two or three is going to be, it's going to be a title called Where Where is Esau? Because I've already shown you that they've hidden themselves, but I'm going to do an entire video on how Esau has hidden himself. Guess who threw? Through the seed of Japheth. And Japheth is the Gentiles. They merged himself. Esau merged himself and married the wives of the Gentiles and hid his seed in them. So once again, learn not the ways of the heathen or the Gentiles. I don't need to go any further with you and argue about a Christmas tree. I don't need to go any further and argue with you about decking it with silver and gold, putting up lights, uh, giving Christmas gifts and di different things like that. He said, learn not the way of the gent of the heathen, of the Gentiles. And verse 3 says, for the customs of the people are vain. I'm going to click on that word vain. Futile. The customs of the people are futile. And we can see what customs are. Let's see what the word customs is. That's the word chapa. Meaning a custom, manners, ordinance, and statutes. So we see their ordinances. We see their appointed times of customs. So the customs of the people are vain. Don't do them. The Most High is tired of us whoring around with whorish gods and whorish paganistic ways. I'm talking to those who really serve him. If you're a Christian and you want to defend Christianity and Christmas, get off this video. Go somewhere else. I'm not even talking to you. Unsubscribe from me. Block my channel. Do whatever you got to do. I'm talking to those who actually love the Most High, who are tired of doing wrong by him, and who want to see them live a better life and do what the Most High say. So if you don't want to do that, get off this video right now. I'm talking to the true people of God, the true people of the Most High, the true people of, 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 of Hakadesh Rewak, the true people of Yah. We have got to stop whoring with these paganistic gods. You see, I'm upset about this because we because I, I lived this my whole life. I did this my whole life. And if I would have known I would have been whoring with other, other guys and whoring with other women, I would have stopped this a long time ago. We've got to stop this. And we've got to stop this now. This is Christians wake up. It's time for you to wake up. I'm out.